I assume you want to hear one last speaker? <laughs> right, let me introduce to you Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party now and in September, and the next Prime Minister. I understand the PA system needs to be upgraded because the rallies are getting so big, people at the back can't hear. Wave at the back if you can hear me. Yeah, that's a pretty good wave. Right over there, can you hear? Yeah. Thank you everyone very much for coming here tonight, taking part in this democratic experiment. Experience. Excitement, future of our lives in this country, <laughs> development of our ideas, our socialist values, so many things. Can I start by saying thank you to Martin for introducing and all the work that he's put in on so many of these organizational <laughs> issues and rallies and everywhere else all over the Southwest. <laughs> thank you to all the volunteers who put tonight's event together at very short notice. Because without volunteers, we would be nothing. Without people giving up their time, their energy, and sharing their imagination, we would be nothing. All of our rallies must be open and accessible, because unfortunately our national media are not making our message open and accessible. So we have to do it ourselves. And when we put up on the social media that this rally was taking place, over 2,000 people registered very, very quickly. That shows the interest and the enthusiasm to spread a different message. I also want to say a big thank you to Naomi and Pascal, our two signers, who are making sure that everyone can understand and follow what's been said here tonight. Because as with our politics being open and accessible to all, all our events are open and accessible to all. Because that is the kind of society we all want to live in. Now Bristol is an amazing city. I was here standing under that tree over there in May when we celebrated the election of Marvin as the mayor of Bristol. An incredible day and an incredible achievement and I was proud to have played my own part in helping and supporting as I'm sure every one of you here was as well but then you think back to the history of this city all the struggles that took place struggles against racism struggles for industrial democracy struggles for wages struggles for rights all those things that built the labor movement in Bristol Never forget our history, always look at it and understand it because we ride on the shoulders of others who've gone before us and struggled and sacrificed. And so I think of those that stood up against racism in the bus industry, in the Bristol bus boycott, and Paul Stevenson and the work that he did at that time and the way in which Tony Benn, an MP at that time, stood with them just as he stood with the people of Kenya during the uprisings there, just as he stood, not just for this city, but stood for peace, justice, and anti-racism the world over. And so this, at one level, is a leadership campaign for the Labour Party, of course, and I tell you, if uh, there's a decision made that uh, there has to be another one next year or the year after and so on, we're ready, we're willing, we're able, we're strong, we are determined. And from the launch of our campaign on the 21st of July, 
This is the 16th rally we've already done all over the country. We've been in London, we've been in Salford, we've been in Durham, we've been in York, we've been in Hull, we've been in Leeds, we've been in Brighton, we've been in Swansea, we've been in Mercer, we've been in Redruth in Cornwall, and we've been in Brighton and we're here today. And we're going to be in every part of Britain over the next weeks. doing two things. One is carrying a message about the strength and unity of our party, but it's also carrying a message that the political and economic and social message we're giving to the meetings that people come to and the media that report us and interview us is of relevance to everybody else within our society. Think very hard about the issues that people face. The levels of insecurity in their lives. The injustice that takes place at the workplace. The lack of housing. The way in which students are loaded with so much debt because they've had the temerity to want to receive and achieve a university education. And so, the message we're putting out is that we're calling time on the way in which politics and economics has been done in this country for a very long time. Others mentioned neoliberal economics. I remember speaking to a union branch meeting in the mid-1970s and uh, a member, I was a union organizer for NUPI, National Union of Public Employees, a member said to me, uh, brother, what, um, what does privatization mean? <laughs> the Tory right-wing think tanks were starting down the road of privatization and rolling back the state. Ronald Reagan in the USA was promoting Proposition 13 in California to roll back the public services in California. Margaret Thatcher here was learning the same thing. And then we had the misery of the 1980s with Reaganomics in the United States and Thatcher economics here. Mass unemployment, attacks on trade unions, deindustrialization, the promotion of individualism and greed at the expense of the collective need of all of us. That was the watchwords that they put forward. And as it went on, those politics, those economics, those values infected so many others and so much other thinking. It even infected elements within our own party and our own labour movement in Britain. And we have to call time on the economics that says poverty is inevitable, inequality is inevitable, grotesque levels of individual wealth are somehow or other a price the rest of us have to pay in the hope that one day some of that wealth might trickle down to the homeless on our streets. Well, it never did work like that, and it never should work like that. And so whilst at the last election, like all of you here, I was devastated by the result because I knew what was coming. I knew what a Tory government on its own would try to do. We knew all of that. But then you ask yourself some questions. Why was it that we didn't win that election? We put a lot of work in, we put a huge amount of effort in, we all did that. But the fundamental problem was that we were not offering something sufficiently different. We were saying we would continue with the public sector wage freeze, just penalising every public sector worker. And we said we would still make cuts because we seem not to have learnt the lesson of the banking crisis of 2008-9. Was it caused by greedy doctors, greedy nurses, greedy street cleaners? Was it caused by the greed of the homeless or those wanting somewhere decent to live? Or was it caused by an out of control banking system that fleeced us all in the process? And so when the issue came up last summer of the future leadership of our party, 
a number of us got together and said, look, this must be the time when the Labour Party can offer something radically different to our society. And so we contested that leadership election a year ago. And you all know the result of that. And the first thing we did was set up a shadow cabinet and I was very pleased and proud to appoint John McDonnell as a shadow chancellor of the Exchequer. And John has changed the whole debate on the economy. He's called it out for what it is. Austerity is not an economic necessity, it's a political choice that's been made. A political choice to redistribute wealth and power in absolutely the wrong direction. And I thank John and congratulate John and all of his team for the work they've done on that. And so these days, you can't find anybody that apparently ever supported anything different. <laughs> Yet, it's only a year and um, a week and a bit away that the Labour Party was tragically planning to abstain on a welfare reform bill that was taking 12 billion pounds out of the pockets of the poorest and most vulnerable in our whole society. We have to do things differently. And that is why we put forward a very, very different political agenda within our society. So look at the issues that people are faced with. Grotesque levels of inequality, falling wages as a proportion of gross national income, inequality at the workplace, and appalling work practices. Jeff was talking about trade union rights. Ask yourself this question. If in 1970, Shirebrook Colliery in Nottinghamshire was a fully unionized, properly paid, relatively safe, well-organized workplace with 100% trade union membership, public ownership of the industry, and a community infrastructure that backed it up. Thatcher came along 10 years later. Thatcher came along 10 years later with uh, her principles of free market economics destroyed the mining industry, destroyed much of the steel industry and so much else of British industry at that time. And in doing that, she knew she was paving the way for greater levels of inequality and greater levels of personal wealth. So here we are now in 2016, where the proportion of money going to the super rich, going in dividends and executive pay is rising. The relative proportion on wealth and wages is decreasing and inequality is absolutely enormous as a result of it. And then go back to that same site of Shirebrook. And what do you have there now? Sport Direct Warehouse. Ambulance is called because there's such a lack of safety at the workplace. Fire tenders called because of the danger of uh, fire in that particular building. Most of the workers on zero hours contracts, the aggregate of which doesn't even add up to a minimum wage across a week or across a fortnight or a month. And people encouraged to blame migrant workers for working there, blame any nearby minority, always blame somebody else except those that brought in a system that not just allows but encourages zero hours contracts, insecure working, grotesque levels of exploitation. So I say thank you to Unite the Union for calling time on that place, for trying to organise that place and for making sure that yes you've got before a parliamentary select committee an all party select committee that collectively expressed their horror at it. But expressing horror at it isn't enough. We need a change. We need legislation that guarantees rights at work, that guarantees your right to join a trade union and be represented by that union, that ensures that every large employer must negotiate with appropriate trade unions so that we enfranchise the majority of the population 
at the workplace as well as at the ballot box. These things are actually very important. And there are other, other issues that have to be dealt with. Another example, of course, is uh, Philip Green, a splendidly hard-working chap, I'm sure. But he needs his long weekends and he doesn't like to stick around too much for them. So he gets the plane down to Monaco on a Thursday night, spends the weekend there making sure he doesn't pay too much tax in Britain and comes back the next week to continue running down BHS, its pension fund, its jobs, its supply chain and everything else. Surely we need a government that would intervene and prevent that disgrace going on and that treatment of people. And as we're here tonight in Bristol, not so far away, along the coast in South Wales, is Port Talbot, biggest steelworks. People have given their lives to that place, produced very high quality steel. It's a necessary place for all of us. If we're to have a manufacturing industry in Britain, there has to be a steel industry to go with it. So why should their future be negotiated solely between global corporations in faraway places. Isn't it the duty and responsibility of the government of this country to be involved, make it, taking a stake in that industry and ensuring its survival? In exactly the same way, in the 1970s, when Tony Benn was Secretary of State for Industry, he made sure we intervened in the shipbuilding and aircraft industry, steel industry, oil and all the others to ensure, yes, jobs survived, yes, industries developed, yes, there was investment, but also that we all benefited from that investment through public ownership or public participation. Surely it's time for government to be involved. So, when people say that uh, we're not reaching out to people, I simply say this. The attendance here tonight, there are thousands of us here on this square, many thousands of us here. Some of you might be members of the Labour Party, some of you might not be members of the Labour Party, some of you might not even in the past have been supporters of the Labour Party. But I hope if you're not, you will recognize that what we're doing is opening up and changing politics to bring people in so that everyone's knowledge and imagination can be used to develop the kind of policies in society that we need. So it's not just the elite somewhere else doing it, it's all of us. There are so many areas that I could talk about, but I just want to mention two. I'm so proud of what Diane Abbott said tonight about health policy. So proud of what she said about mental health in this country and the way in which she described how her mother worked in the National Health Service dealing with people going through a mental health crisis. She is developing our policies on this. And I simply say this, how we deal with the health service and mental health is a litmus test to everything else we do in our society. A health service free of the point of use as a human right is something Nye Bevan fought for and achieved. This government simply doesn't get it. They do understand the power of the words NHS. They quote them often enough, but they also understand the power of the market of the NHS. They quote that less often, but they think about it every moment. And so, the Health and Social Care Act they pushed through under the coalition government requires services to be sold off and put out to private tender, continues the underfunding of commissioning groups all over the country, through PFI allows every hospital to be in debt or deficit while the PFI is paid up front first and the patient care follows on behind. And if this goes on, more and more people who used to work for the NHS will find themselves working for contractors on lower wages with uh, less good conditions, with all that insecurity that goes with that. And gradually, 
you'll see the private medical industry biting around the edges and then biting further and further into our National Health Service. And as the private medical industry grows, our NHS will be more and more under pressure. We all rely on it as a health service is our first and only port of call for any health condition we face. I don't want and none of us will ever allow it to become a health service of last resort for those that can't afford to go private. It's our health service, it's staying, it's always going to be there. The health service also has to deal with the inequalities and injustices of society. Diane was quite right to speak about the mental health crisis. There's a lot of us here tonight, a quarter of us at some point in our lives are going to go through a mental health crisis. Stress, pressure, all kinds of things. Some of us will be lucky. We'll have loving friends, relatives, family, partners who'll see us through and help us through and support us all the way through. Some will access services that aren't there. Some will access the voluntary sector, which will do its best, but might not have the funding to do it. And some, because of prejudice, because of stigma, because of the language the rest of us use, will feel they can't tell anybody they're stressed, frightened of their career prospects, their job, or anything else, and will end up in a lonely and bad place. Change the language on mental health reach out to everybody in genuine parity of esteem between physical and mental health. It's what we're about as a movement, as a party and as a society. One other area of policy I want to mention before I say something else, and that is housing. There is a housing crisis facing every part of this country. In Bristol, it is a housing shortage of the lack of council housing, of a council that's been told by the government it's got to sell off high value properties, of tenants that are being told under pay to stay to get promotion at work they might end up losing their access to council housing, of a council that's been told like everywhere else in the country if it wants to develop housing it's got to somehow or other balance its own payment system for it of those living in a private rented sector, insecure on six month tenancies, knowing that at some point, maybe very soon, they're gonna be moved out and moved on. Of those people who have uh, somehow or other dropped through the whole system because of um, family breakup, illness, all kinds of things, end up sleeping on the streets of this country, it'll be another night trying to get into a park while the rest of us leave a park after a lovely evening to go home. That is the reality of modern Britain. And for children growing up in an insecure private rented flat, knowing they might have to leave their mates and move school, having no security. And young people, even from relatively well-off backgrounds, totally unable to buy anywhere of their own to live. We have created a housing shortage in order that some people can make a great deal out of that housing shortage. I think we should approach things in a completely different way. Look at the issues in rural areas also, where villages have been developed into um, a summer second home for those that can afford a second home, a very poor existence for those who manage to remain in a rented place in that village but haven't got a car and the bus service has closed down and gradually rural life closes down around them because of a lack of investment in rural housing or in rural transport. The issues are fundamentally very, very similar. Are we to do nothing about this housing crisis or instead are we to look at it this way? If we invest in building good quality homes for people to live in, environmentally sustainable, passive house standard buildings, we achieve a lot of things. One, those that live in them will pay much less in energy bills. Two, they'll have somewhere secure to live for their entire life. Three, 
we create jobs for the building workers and all the way through the supply chain. And instead of the science of managing shortages and difficulties in housing, we'll be instead exciting developments to give everyone somewhere secure, reasonable and decent to live in. So that means building, it means regulating our private rented sector, it means so many other things as well. And that is just one or two of the many policies that we're putting forward. So when people say, well hang on, this leadership campaign is all about personalities. I promise you it's not because I'm not a personality. So what it's about is all of us, what we do together, how we think together and how we change our society together to ensure that everybody together is included, not systematically excluding those that fall by the wayside through poverty, through ill health, through disability or whatever else it happens to be. So it's also about properly funding our local authorities. Yes for housing, yes for adult social care, yes for all those issues. But it's also about funding the creative talent that is in all of us and is in all of our children. Is it so wrong to say as an election manifesto in 2020 or whenever it comes, one of our aims would be that every child has a chance to learn a proper musical instrument at school. Every child has a chance to develop their artistic strength and talent. All these things are so important so you build that cohesion in our society. And so within the ten major points that we put forward are policies of full employment our policies of investment in our economy through a 500 billion pound national investment bank to fund infrastructure in the southwest the underfunding of the rail system west of exeter is a disgrace the underfunding of much of the investments in the north of england is a disgrace there has to be a regional balance on how those investment decisions are made and so we have an extending we have an extending and expanding economy. And I'm getting heckled from the back of the stage in a wonderful, comradely way. Saying I should finish soon. <laughs> no, 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 no. I promised you that was not the answer I was looking for. So, culture is part of our lives, part of our spirit part of what we think. But it's also how we treat our children in school and the ambitions and aspirations we give them. And so when young people or older people want to go back to college, to adult learning and adult education as well as university education and study, study engineering, study law, study nursing, study medicine, lots and lots of things. Yes, they do benefit, of course they do. But we also all benefit. If there's a good engineer around, the train is likely to be safer. Yeah. If there's a good nurse around, the medicine is better, a good doctor, and so it goes on. So can we stop the idea that all education has to be, is a competition between schools rather than a family of schools? And that higher education should be a right, not a commodity, to be sold as it is in the present time. So, our politics is developing, our politics is changing in this country. So in less than a year, suddenly, anti-austerity is the buzzword for everybody. Suddenly, all those dark days when we used to be talking of privatization, wage freezes, selling things off, reducing the state of somehow or other, a distant memory of all of 10 months ago. Um, so we need to uh, be aware that there's a long way to go in this campaign and a long way to go in everything that we want to achieve. Because 
I've heard for too long, ever since the Reaganomics period of the 70s, that somehow or other, what my generation was given in terms of pensions, housing, education, and all these things is mysteriously not going to be available for my children's generation. And it certainly won't be available for my grandchildren's generation. And it definitely won't be available for the generations after that. And then you look at the headline figures around the world of the science and advances we're all making, the technology that is available, the growing wealth around the world. And you say, hang on a minute. If we're in a richer society, in a wealthier world, a more technical world, a more scientific world, surely to goodness, all that science could be used to share it out a bit, rather than taking it to the hands of a few, not the many. So these fundamental principles. But it's also about how we do our politics. Politics comes when people come together. Political change comes when people come together comes from being united as communities, opposing racism or discrimination in any form whatsoever within our society. And we're all the stronger when we do things together. And so what we're doing is offering a political alternative, offering a politics of hope, not fear, offering a politics of redistribution, not inequality offering a politics that does work for the vast majority of people within our society. Sadly, I suspect some of our media don't fully understand or don't wish to understand the message that we're giving. But I tell you this, take heart from the numbers with us. Take heart from the enthusiasm of young people who were driven away from politics in the past by joining in this fantastic movement. No one person, no community, nobody is forgotten in the kind of world we want to live in. And we want that world to be a world of peace, of justice, of human rights and democracy, not of more and more wars such as we had in Iraq. We can do things together here to create that good influence around the world and excite and soothe and unite people. So I say it the last time, nobody and no community ever left behind. Thank you very much. coming a fantastic evening i think and topped off by a fantastic speech from our next prime minister